Good evening, everybody. Everybody at home, it's great to be here tonight with you. Uh, I have a question for you. When's the last time you were on timeout? Any been on timeout recently? It's humbling, isn't it? So I have a, a two-year-old daughter. Her name is Hope. And you may hear her talk to me in the audience tonight. There she is. It was dinner time, and my daughter had a toy, and we said, I told her, I said, Hope, we don't have toys at the table. You got to go put that away. And she says, no. And I said, Hope, we don't say no to daddy. Go put your toy away. And she just looked at me, and I said, Hope, do you need a time out? She says, no. I said, okay. So I walk up to her, and, and I reach for the toy, and she hands it to me, and I start walking away to go put it in the living room for her. And she says, no, you don't take my toy. You are on timeout. <laughs> now there was something that she wanted and she was willing to do whatever it took, whatever means were at her disposal, whatever way she could come up with to create the scenario that she wanted. How many of you guys have ever been there in life? There's something that you wanted, a way that you wanted things to turn out, something that you wanted for yourself, and you were willing to do what it took to get that. <laughs> um, if I say, tonight we're going to be talking about living humbly. If I say that we are called to live a humble life, how many of you guys feel like your heart is just kind of met with defeat or deflation. Living a humble life. Yes, let's do that. That's exciting. Let's live humble. No, it's almost like somebody kind of reached into your heart's sails and then just sucks the wind right out of it, right? Like that's the way that you feel like you're going to be sailing for the rest of your life is you just live this humble life that is just full of excitement. Well, today we're going to talk about what 1 Peter 5 has to say about living humbly. But before we do, well, and why in the world anybody would want to do this. But before we do, I just want to give you a quick reminder about what 1 Peter is all about. So 1 Peter is written by Peter. Uh, he's writing to the Christians scattered across Rome. It was most likely written in Rome. And it was a word of encouragement and instruction for living an anchored life in a hostile culture. Anybody relate? Okay. Uh, reminding us that our citizenship is in heaven. It encourages us to set our hopes on things that are in heaven, things that are unshakable. And uh, it, it's a reminder to live by a kingdom way and culture that, and when we do that, that we shine, that we are forever linked to Christ's victory over sin and over the enemy. Now in chapter five, he reminds the church that they have access to divine strength as they walk humbly with him. And that's our invitation here tonight. Now the definition of humility, how many of you guys feel like humility is kind of one of those Christianese words that we all use and we all kind of understand what it means. But if I was to ask you, tell me what humility means, we might come up with like 15 different definitions or exactly what that plays out like. I'm not hundred percent sure. It just means, you know, be less. Um, definition of humility. I figured we'd just start with Googling it. Let's Google it. Dictionary uh, as Google says is to lower in dignity or importance. Jesus told a parable in the gospels about a banquet, uh, a dinner feast. And he said, don't sit yourself at the highest seat at the table, because if you do, the master of the table might come and find somebody else sitting somewhere lower at the table, invite that person up to the front, and then you might be humiliated while you have to go sit at the very back of the table again. He says, no, 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 go sit yourself at the table, at the master's table, but don't, don't exalt yourself. And then when the master finds you sitting at the lower seat of the table, and he says, friend, what are you doing over here? Let me exalt you. Let me bring you to the front of the table. He sets this example, this picture of what humility looks like. The Bible encyclopedia. Do you guys know there was a Bible encyclopedia? I, I grew up with the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, for those of you who are, are, are young, this is before Google. Uh, there were books. And if you wanted to know stuff, you just read it. But uh, it says this. It says, it is the spontaneous recognition of the creature's absolute dependence on his creator. An ungrudging, unhypocritical acknowledgement of the gulf which separates self 
subsistent being from utterly contingent being. The translation of all of that heady stuff is, I need you. I need you. That's what it means. The best example we have of this actually comes from Jesus. In Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8, it says, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus demonstrated humility by being willing to lower his own status, give up his own rights and accept God's will over his own. Now, Peter would have seen all of this firsthand. He would have experienced all of this. And this would have been the lens, the firsthand example of what humility, true humility looks like. This is what he would have been writing from the deep well in his own heart that he would have been writing from when he wrote this book. So today we're going to talk about what is humble living. We're going to talk about the enablement of humble living and being anchored to divine strength. So let's jump in. What is humble living? We're in first Peter chapter five. For those of you who are following along first Peter chapter five, verse one says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, clothe yourselves, all of you with humility toward one another for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So I'd like to break this down a little bit. Living humbly is submission. This is another one of those words that just pumps you up for living this way, doesn't it? Yes, let's all live submitted. Um, It's a realization that it's not about you. How many of you guys are uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe fans? Anybody? I, I know I miss it. Um, this, is, this one's from Doctor Strange. This is the lesson that he learns in his movie. It's not about you. The whole thing is, is it's not about you. If you are responsible for others, then humble submission means putting the needs of others before your own wants and plans. For those of us who are parents, you understand this well. Nothing in your life revolves around you. Everything revolves around the humble, or the, the little beings that you have to put first in your life. But this can look, a lot of, this can look like a lot of different things. Um, but it's about putting other people's needs before your own plans, the things that you want. It might be resetting the house before you decide to sit down and watch the latest episode of Mandalorian. Uh, It might be getting everything ready for tomorrow when uh, you would rather talk to your friends or for those of you who are youth play games. It's just putting the needs of others before yourself. And for those of you who are responsible to someone, humble submission means hearing and listening, even when you'd rather not. And even when you think you know better, in fact, it means listening and submitting, even when you do know better, because it's actually not about whether or not you are right in that moment. It's about the confidence in the promises of God. Living humbly is about living in the, in confidence in the promises of God. It's letting go of your own rights and the things that you can make happen for yourself because you believe God's plans are better for you. And there might be something that you can make happen for yourself. And there might be something that's available to you that you can uh, work out right now. But if the Lord isn't offering it to you, then you're willing to let the Lord's will be done in your life. You can't surrender control. That's the thing. You can't surrender control uh, to the Lord over things in your life. If you don't have confidence in his heart towards you, in his will for you, in his plans for your future, because you'll always be wondering, you'll always be second guessing. But if you're certain, if you're confident in who God is towards you, 
then it's easy to let it go. There was this time uh, when I first got married, or actually this was before we first got married. Um, I wanted a motorcycle. I wanted a motorcycle bad. I was 16. I told my dad I wanted a motorcycle. And my dad's like, okay, let's go get you a motorcycle. He went down to the dealership and I had no money and he had no money. And so it just worked out that there was no financing available. And my dad also had terrible credit. Um, so it, we didn't get a motorcycle that day. And I wanted a motorcycle so bad for years and years. And so I, I just quoted this verse back to the Lord all the time. You know, ask, seek, knock, just keep banging on the Lord's door and you're going to get that motorcycle. That's what I, for years, I would just pray, Lord, I want this, I want this blue Kawasaki Ninja. I want a motorcycle. And for years and years, the Lord just silent, nothing, right? And I actually kind of tried to make it happen in my own strength. And then, uh, and then a day came where uh, I was married. This is many years later. And, uh, and my wife goes, okay, you could get a motorcycle now if you want to. You want to go get a motorcycle? And we had the ability. The opportunity was available. And, and what I realized was I don't actually want a motorcycle, because when I was 16, I thought I was immortal. Nothing bad was ever gonna happen to me. It was just gonna be awesome. And by the time I got married, I realized that I, was, I kind of felt like I was playing Russian roulette with it. You know, everything might work out fine, 99 times, but the hundredth time I could lose everything. And I just, I didn't actually want it. I thought I wanted it, but I didn't actually want it. And it was because I was willing to humbly submit myself to the Lord and wait on the Lord's plans. Not at first. I mean, he was gracious enough to kind of uh, walk me into it. But, uh, but eventually when the Lord gave me the opportunity, I was like, no, actually your plans for my life are better than my plans for me. And so I'm willing to submit myself to you. Uh, and this is the confidence uh, that comes from humble living. Humble living is a patient life. It's not a life that's yoked to hurry. It's the best way that I can describe this for you. A non-humble life is always in a rush. There's a sense of urgency and a desperation to make things happen because you're doing it on your own. You're doing it in your own strength. You've got to make something happen. Let's, let's go. But humble living understands that God is in control and you have confidence in God's control over your life. You have confidence in God's plans. And so it enables you, it empowers you to say, what's happening right now may be not what my plans are. It may not look the way that I want it to, but it's okay because God's in control. And so instead of trying to accomplish everything like a sprint all at once, just get it all done right now and just make it happen so that we can just get past this. You can embrace the moment and say, Lord, you're in control. You're doing something today. I submit to whatever it is that you're doing. And I don't have all the pieces. You didn't lay out the blueprints in front of me this morning when I woke up. So whatever you're doing, I just trust that it's good. I humble myself. I don't elevate myself to your status. Like I should know everything and I should be in control of everything. And I should be consulted before you do whatever it is that you're doing. And I just trust you. I think though, as we process living humbly, we're all more okay with living humbly with God, right? Cause it's supposed to be that way. God is like all powerful, all knowing, all good, like all the right things. Even that's still kind of hard sometimes because I'd rather have it my way. And often I catch myself wondering why he didn't consult me in some of his decision-making process. Cause I have great plans, but I don't, I, I can, I can wrestle with humbling myself before God. I should probably be humble before God, even when I don't feel like it. The hard part is being humble with each other, right? If we're being honest, it's way harder to be humble with you. And it's probably way harder for you to be humble with me because I catch myself wondering things like, do you deserve it? <laughs> Let's just call it out. Are you trustworthy if I humble myself before you? Are you going to be a benevolent creature like my heavenly father and you're going to do right by me and only always? Are your plans, thoughts, and ways really more beneficial and better than my own? Do you really know better than I do? So if, that's, if I don't know all that for certain, why in the world would I humble myself before you? I have a hard enough time humbling myself before and an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-benevolent God. And if that's, if I know that's true, then how, how can I possibly humble myself before you? So the heart of this is 
even when somebody else measures up less than God's status, the reason we humble ourselves to each other, not just to the Lord, is because our confidence doesn't come from how you're going to respond back to me when I humble myself to you. My confidence doesn't come from how this is going to work out well if I do the right thing with you. I might humble myself before you and do the right thing, and it might work out terribly because of what you do next. Your next move might be awful. However, my confidence comes in how the Lord's blessing is over my life because I humbled myself and submitted myself the way he called me to. And so when I do what my heavenly father asks, my confidence comes from him, not from you. It takes the burden off of our relationship. You can totally whiff it. You can totally mess it up. You could swing and miss this next one and it's okay. Because even if you do, my father's got it covered. His grace is sufficient for that. I used to work for a title company. It was the first real job that I had. Uh, my first job was working for In-N-Out, but my first, you know, big boy job was working for a title company. And if you don't know what that is, you're not alone. Most people don't. Um, I, I, uh, I got this job and it has to do with homes and, and loans and all kinds of boring stuff. But in 2007, 2008, there was a recession. And the manager came through our office and said, I need everybody to come together in five minutes. I have a really important meeting we have to have. Like, okay, so we all come together and the manager says, you're all being laid off, everybody on this floor. Some will be laid off this month. Some will be laid off next month. Some will be laid off the month after that. So go ahead and get your resumes ready. That's it. And uh, as they're dis dismissing the meeting, I'm in a bullpen with a bunch of other guys who have the same job as I do. And we all start processing immediately. What are we going to do? How are you going to handle this? How is this? How are you processing this moment? And, uh, and some people immediately are like, well, that's it. I'm just going to sit back. I'm not doing any more work until they let me go. And some people were like freaking out. They were like, I don't know what I'm going to do next. And I don't even know how I got this job. And they were, they were freaking out and they don't know what they're going to do. And uh, as, they were, as we were starting to process this and anxiety was an all-time high, the manager comes walking by. Uh, I have a half wall right, right by my desk and she taps the, the desk right there and she goes, Sean, uh, come see me. Uh, at lunchtime today, I need to talk to you. And I was like, great. First on the chopping block. I didn't go see her that day. And uh, I, uh, you guys ever seen Office Space? I'm like, maybe they'll just keep me on the payroll. Um, so uh, I didn't go see her. And, uh, and as we're processing, I the next day I found out they were taking all of our jobs and they were moving them to Northern California because it was cheaper to have them there. And my manager uh, and I said, you know what? Whatever happens... I might get a couple extra days of pay because I'm pretty sure my manager wanted to let me go first, but the company's in this spot and I, I feel like I should do the right thing. I had knowledge about how to do my job a particular way that only came from experience. And the people who were gonna take over my job, they would have had a learning curve. And I could have said, you know, I'm valuable to you company. You should keep me and here's why and try to play games and do all this kind of stuff. But instead what I decided to do is say, Lord, you're in control. Whatever you're up to is more important than my plans and, and the way that I would work it out. So I'll just do the right thing. I wrote out everything that I knew about how to do my job the way that only I knew how to do it. And I sent it on to the people who were going to be taking my job and uh, they and their managers so that everybody, everybody got that info. They got it. Uh, they forwarded it back to my manager. My manager pulled me into, my, into her office and said, Sean, I saw that email that you sent. Yep. Why'd you do that? Uh, it seemed like the right thing to do. That's good. Uh, we're not letting you go. We're promoting you. We're, we're keeping you. And while we're letting everybody else go, we're keeping you. And we're going to give you a $12,000 a year raise. <laughs> and, and what occurred to me in that moment was humbly submitting myself before the Lord and saying, Lord, I have no idea what's going on right now. Everything feels out of control. Everybody else is in anxiety. So am I, I'm stressed out. But I humble myself before you and I submit myself to whatever it is that you want to do right now. The Lord accomplished more in 48 hours than everybody else around me did with all of their striving and hard work. I didn't have to elevate myself. What I learned that day was my relationship with God was extremely valuable and the power of humbling myself before him. So let's talk about the enablement of humble living. First Peter chapter five, uh, verse six says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time, 
he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. See, humble living enables God to exalt you. It removes the burden of having to figure everything out all by yourself. And it removes the burden of having to exalt yourself, having to advance yourself in life. Humble living enables you to live under God's care. I think we all care about ourselves. We're really good at doing that. But I can only care for myself so well. It's like uh, if I told my five-year-old, okay, go ahead, handle everything by yourself. He might be able to handle some things by himself, but he can't do it all by himself. And I can't do everything by myself either. I'm a child of God. I'm, I might be 36 years old, but I can't handle everything by myself. I still need him. I'm still reliant on him. Humble living enables you to live by faith and to resist the enemy. It removes the need to take matters into your own hands and it creates space for God to move in ways that you can't and that you wouldn't. It also enables you to experience victories that you can't imagine. You guys remember the prophet Elisha from the Old Testament? He was awesome. He had a lot of really cool miracles. If you haven't read about them, I encourage you. They're, they're exciting stuff. There's one time where Elisha and his servant wake up and they're completely surrounded by enemies everywhere. And his servant says, Elisha, wake up. We're surrounded. There's bad guys all around us. And Elisha prays and he says, Lord, open his eyes. Let him see. Let him see. And he opens his eyes and he sees surrounding the enemy, angels surrounding them, fiery chariots and the heavenly host. And as I was processing this this week, what occurred to me is, I don't know that Elisha saw all that stuff. I always read this story thinking Elisha knew that was always there. Like he had angel eyes, like, you know, he could just always see them. He always knew. And that's why I don't think that was actually true. I think Elisha had confidence in his relationship with God. And so he didn't need to ask God about every single thing that came along the way. Because in, in his ability, as he humbled himself before the Lord, he began to grow in his trust and in his relationship and his understanding of God's love for him. So when he prayed and he said, Lord, open his eyes. The Lord's like, what you're asking me to do is to communicate a life's Time worth of experience of you learning to trust me that my intentions toward you are good. How can I do that in a moment? I know. Open his eyes. Let him see something that will completely change his perspective. But Elisha, I don't think he needed it. I think he came from a place where he was comfortable being submitted to the Lord, even in the face of chaos. The second time that I got laid off in this company, it's my favorite time being laid off. They actually laid me off. It was still the same recession. It was bad. And they had, they asked me to do some sales stuff and um, the sales stuff just didn't pan out. There was no business. The real estate market dried up completely. And uh, my manager called me into his office and he says, Sean, what do you want me to do? I like you, but you're not producing. And there's, and I said, I know there's nothing to produce. He says, I know. Uh, so what do you, what would you want? What would you do if you were me? What would you do? And I said, if I was you, I would take the accounts that I have, I would give them to this salesperson who I know has this many accounts and maybe it's enough for you to be able to justify keeping that person. And if I was you, I'd let me go. And I could tell the look on his face was like, God, don't say that. Come up with some lame excuse so that you and I can, I can fight you on it. You and I can have this conversation where you're like, you know, I should let you go. And you go, yeah, okay. And then it just ends that way. Don't say the right thing. And, uh, and he's like, okay, look, for the next two weeks, just go find another job. I like you. I don't want you to be left out in the cold. Don't even worry about coming into work. Just find something else. Okay. So the next two weeks I tried and I couldn't. And he calls me in and we're filling out the paperwork. And he says, did you find something else? I said, no, but I'm looking. I, I, there, there might be some things that are on the horizon for me. He says, okay. 
And I leave the office and I'm trying really hard to walk in faith and to be confident in God's plans for me. And I'm failing. <laughs> I am I am miserably failing. So I decide to go to Costco because Costco makes everything better. And I'm like, you know what? I have at least this paycheck. When he sends me away, he sends me away with a little, a little parting gift. It was a couple hundred dollars. And, uh, and, and I said, I'm going to use that money. I'm going to go buy all the things at Costco that I want to eat. And, uh, and then I'm going to go to the food court and I'm going to go buy all, I'm going to go buy a pizza, a hot dog, a frozen yogurt, because man, this just sounds good right now. And uh, the whole time I'm walking through Costco, I'm just depressed. I am at a low point. And this should be a point where I'm walking confident and humble with the Lord saying, Lord, your plans are good. No, God, your plans are awful. Are you, are you paying attention to what's happening right now? The wheels are falling off. That's how I felt. I get to the, the food court line and the guy goes, hey, how are you doing? And I go, good, I guess. How are you? And he looks me dead in the eyes. It still gives me goosebumps every time I tell this story. He looks me dead in the eyes, complete stranger. And he says, better than I deserve because I know I'm going to heaven. What can I get for you? I was like, who says that? <laughs> who are you? Uh, no, now all of a sudden I have guilt and shame. I feel horrible. I feel horrible about feeling horrible. It was terrible. I go home and I'm feeling awful about feeling awful. And I'm putting all the food in the house and I'm eating my frozen yogurt and feeling guilty about eating frozen yogurt. And I'm like, I should be experiencing this differently, but I can't. And uh, I don't know, God, what's going on? And I'm having a really hard time living humbly submitted to the Lord and his plans and having confidence that his plans are better than mine. At four o'clock, my manager calls me and, uh, and I'm like, oh, what's this about? I pick it up and I'm like, hey, how are you? I'm like trying to act all confident and strong and whatever. And he's like, hey, did you find another job yet? And I was immediately insulted. And I was like, not yet. It's, it's only four o'clock. I'll find one eventually. Um, and he goes, okay, well, uh, you want to come back and work for me? And I was like, what? He's like, yes, yeah, I, I found a different position. And I was like, oh, this is going to be some like mail delivery person. And, uh, and I'm like, sure. What do you have? And he's like, uh, it's, it pays the same as you had before, but this time it comes with commission. And I was like, What? And he's like, yeah, so you'll, you'll, you'll get paid more. I was like, sounds good. Uh, and he's like, uh, so do you need time? Do you, do you have plans or when can you start? I was like, I could start on Monday. He's like, okay, great. See you then. I hung up the phone and I realized through this experience, the Lord moved me out of a very unstable environment into a very stable environment. He gave me commission every month that I didn't have before. And for the weekend, he gave me several hundred extra dollars. I didn't miss a single day's work. And when I came back, my job was awesome on Monday. It was way better than the job that I had before. In the moment though, it was really hard. How many of you guys would agree that living humbly can be very difficult? Here's the invitation that the Holy Spirit would like to extend to you tonight. Living humbly is not an org chart. It's not a hierarchy. Living humbly is about a relationship with God. It's an invitation to trust. His plans are good for you. He can be relied upon. He's there with you in the midst of the chaos and all the really hard things that you're going through. He understands you don't have all the pieces. He didn't give them to you. He knows what you're working with. He says, but I'm still asking you to trust me. Can you? I think if you're like me, you might prefer to be like Elisha's servant and just see the angels and see what's actually going on here, right? But I promise you that if you can step into this invitation, you walk around like Elisha. You walk around with just confidence that God is in control and that that's a good thing for you. And that even when you're completely surrounded, the game isn't over. The Lord's in control. His intentions for you are good. I'm going to wrap this up in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. It says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. God's strength is 
our divine strength is God's restoration promise of what's been lost, broken, stolen, or destroyed. Divine strength is God's confirmation on your gifts and talents and abilities. We're all looking for that. God, divine strength is God's strength for your trials and tribulations. Everything that you go through. And divine strength is God's establishment of your life. So you don't have to establish yourself. When we humble ourselves before God and each other, we have divine strength to face every challenge and overcome every obstacle. Let me pray with you. Father, tonight we resist the impulse to view uh, light or to view living humbly as a, as a hierarchy, as an org chart, as a, uh, I guess that just means I'm supposed to be less than. I, I should just knock myself down and self-deprecate and all this kind of stuff. That's not what it's about. Humbling myself is remembering that you are entirely self-sufficient and I am entirely reliant. That is a little bit scary if I'm being totally honest because I don't like being reliant. I actually like being self-sufficient. And being reliant on you puts me in a vulnerable spot. I know I shouldn't feel vulnerable because you're a good God, because you're big and you're powerful and there's, you can do anything and everything and your intentions toward me are good. But sometimes I have a hard time reconciling that with what I'm experiencing and what I see. And so living humbly before you is complicated. It's challenging. But tonight I hear you, Holy Spirit. Your invitation is relationship with you. It's a risk. It's, it's dangerous because if I choose your way, I have to give up my own. And I don't know for certain what your plan means and what your way will look like because you didn't tell me ahead of time. But Lord, I just envy the strength that Elisha walked with, the confidence that he had to say, I know what it looks like out here, but I know who my God is. And so it's very easy for me to humbly submit myself before him, to trust him and to walk with him. Lord, I pray for that as your church. I pray for that for myself. And I pray for these, your people, Lord, that we would step into that kind of relationship with you. And this week, Lord, I just ask that you would help us to surrender our own way to you, to walk humbly with you. And I ask you to help us identify the places where you're inviting us right now. Not everything all at once, but just something right now where you're inviting us to humble ourselves and submit it before you and say, Lord, your will be done, not my own. Not what I can make happen, but what your plans are for me. Give us the strength to take that risk and watch your faithfulness shine in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.